Well, it is Christmas week. How y'all doing? Good. Good. Are we ready? Are we ready for Christmas? No. Yes. Man, um, what a cool week. Um, amidst all the chaos at the malls and, and getting the house all decorated, um, I know I walked in here today thinking, I have no clue if there's going to be light and heat in our building because we have new owners as of this week and hopefully everything got taken care of account-wise there and, and it did so. Um, but amidst all of this, we're celebrating this week God breaking into our world um, and becoming one of us and then joining us in our lives, saving us and then inviting us to be a part of what he's doing in the world. And so um, it's a pretty exciting week. Um, I know uh, Christina and I have been getting the house ready and um, and we've been lining up our calendar to get everything in its right places. Um, and somewhere in the midst of this, hopefully we're also getting kind of spiritually ready to, to celebrate how God broke into our world. And I know that's what the series has been about, so I want to give you a little recap because it's Christmas time. Not everybody can make it every week. So um, we first talked about having our will uh, ready for God to move in, which meant um, are we open to what God wants to do? And we talked about... Um, Mary and her incredible um, character to say, God, have your way with my life, even though it was not convenient or easy. Um, and John led us in kind of considering our expectations and what we expect to come of Christmas and, and pointed out to us that if we can give those expectations to God and, and let go of those, God might show up in a way that we don't expect this this year and in a, in a powerful way. And, um, and John shared with us our, our hearts and our emotions um, and how um, sometimes we kind of have this emotional tenor of Christmas that we expect God to meet us in and and, um, and God might want to do something different with that this year. And so can we be open to experiencing whatever it is God has for us? And this kind of um, pattern of being open to God wasn't what we were necessarily shooting for when we planned this out at a Starbucks one morning. Um, and yet that's what's emerged. And um, and today I'm gonna I'm gonna try to bring this home by talking about um, having our actions open to God because I I really do believe that um, we can have our heart in the right place we can have our emotions in the right place we can have our will in the right place but if it doesn't actually land and change in our lives and if we don't ever do anything with it um, it's not gonna make a difference in us um, and as I was um, kind of praying this this series through I was. Um, I was reminded of the sower and the seed. In Luke chapter 8, Jesus tells this little parable about how, how uh, God is the farmer and he's scattering seed everywhere. And, and the seed pops up and some of it pops up for a little tiny time and springs up quick. And others of it gets eaten by the birds and, and others of it uh, doesn't really get going. And then some of it, though, some of it lands on good soil and it, and it grows and it bears fruit a hundred times what it was given. Um, and um, and our lives are designed to bear fruit um, for God. And, and when our lives bear fruit for God, when, when Christmas gets a hold of our actions and begins to change the way that we live, I think we experience um, God's fullness in his kingdom in a whole other way than if we do um, just by being near it, kind of observing it. So um, I've had some years where I felt like I was observing Christmas, and that's that's kind of what I'm, I'm seeking to avoid this year is to really engage it and experience it and live into it. So um, to do this, we're going to look at a couple characters from the Christmas story. I'm going to kind of take us through a number of them. Um, and one in particular who, who really responded negatively in his actions towards Christmas. Christmas is here whether we like it or not. God has broken through into our world and, and some things are going to shift. And how we respond is up to us and... Um, we, Herod did not respond well to this news at all. And so we're going to look at Herod and his actions. Um, and then we'll also kind of look at a neutral person, somebody who just kind of, Christmas was off in the corner and they were going about their lives and it didn't change much. And then we're going to look at um, a couple positive responses to Christmas and how that affected them because we're, we're going to have more positives than negatives because we're a positive church. Yeah, that's what we're doing. So, um, I want to start uh, with with Herod, and um, rather than just assuming that we all know the story, and, and I know I'm revisiting it, I always find something new, so I'm going to read for us. Um, Matthew 2 is where you'll find um, Herod, and we're going to 
We're going to take a look at his experience of Christmas here. If Matthew and Zechariah wouldn't all stick together. Okay, there we go. So Matthew 2, we'll read verse um, 3, and then we'll, we'll uh, jump down and do um, 13 through 16. So, um, actually, we'll do 1 through 3. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea, during the, king of, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is the one who was born king of the Jews? We saw a star in the east, and we've come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed, and all Jerusalem with him. And then uh, Herod finds out that maybe they was born in Bethlehem, and the Magi go and, and visit. Um, and then uh, the Magi went home. And, and then it says in verse 13, When they heard that they had gone, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Get up and take the child and his mother, escape to Egypt, and stay there until I tell you, because Herod is going to search for this child to kill him. And so he got up and he took the child and his mother during the night and left for Egypt, where he stayed until the death of Herod. And so was fulfilled what the Lord had said out of Egypt, I call my son. And when Herod realized that he had been outwitted by the Magi, he was furious, and he gave orders to kill all the boys in Bethlehem in its vicinity who were two years old and under, in accordance with the time that he had learned from the Magi. Um, man, Herod, I mean, this is a dramatic, extreme reaction to Christmas, but Herod was, um, he was the ruler appointed by, by Rome to govern Israel, and he was notoriously uh, dead set on keeping that throne and and any threat to it he snuffed out as quickly as possible he um, was known for killing some of his own relatives because he was worried that they might usurp him at some point and so he um, he has to protect his situation and um, and I think when we get a little bit too controlling of where we are and we don't have this flexibility to let God move in our lives, we have a tendency to want to snuff out um, how God might want to surprise us in the midst of it. Um, so let's not be Herod's. John talked a lot more about that, but let's not be Herod's. Um, but then as I, was, as I was listening to our prayer requests, as I was considering this, this stuff, I'm going, there's a lot of stuff that feels like Herod's in our lives. One of my, one of my uh, brothers this year... Is, is just mad at Christmas. I don't know what's going on with that, but he's kind of rebellious against the whole, like, where you have to go buy stuff for all these people because the world tells us to on this particular day, and I'm not going to do it this year. And it's kind of scrooging on the whole Christmas vibe of our family. And, and, and as I was thinking about, man, there's all kinds of stuff that comes up in our lives that feels like that, like it wants to snuff out Christmas, and that's what Herod wanted to do. He's like, I'm going to snuff out this thing that God's trying to do. Um, and I know uh, in my own life I get selfish and I get angsty and, and I get mad that I have to go to the mall still because the mall is just chaos and should not be visited by anybody at this point. And, and I'm going, this isn't what it's about. And I just, I don't want to get like a Herod where it snuffs out the joy of what God is doing and where I lose track of that. You know the Christmas story? Play, movie, all those things. Um, Lewis Carroll's great masterpiece about Scrooge. Uh, and, and here's Scrooge, and, and he's this businessman set on, on greed and accumulation, and to him, Christmas is just ridiculous. You have a bunch of poor people wasting their money to buy each other's stuff and taking time away from their work where they're not productive <coughs> to spend time together. And... Um, there's a little part of me that was like, why was he so mad about Christmas? And I was trying to figure out my brother, obviously, but why is he so mad about Christmas? And um, so I did some digging into the into the whole backstory of Lewis Carroll's masterpiece, and um, I kind of I got to know Scrooge's story. And so here's a little bit of it that you might not have known. Uh, Scrooge's mother had died in childbirth, according to the story, and his father had blamed him for that. And, uh, and then sort of abandoned him to boarding school uh, where when all the other kids went home for the holidays, Scrooge
good state at school. Um, and as he got older, he began to find that he was good at, at, at making money and uh, began to put his hope in that and, and seemed to be succeeding at that. And so um, began to get consumed with this craving for more money. And so as a result, Christmas had no place in his life. Um, loss and guilt and loneliness and craving something different than what God had for him became his story. Um, and it all but snuffed out that little ember of Christmas that God had given him until the ghosts came and sort of uh, restored his humanity restored his recognition of relationship and restored his place of, of generosity. And by the end of the story, um, we all delight in seeing a different Scrooge. And um, I don't know what's going on in your life, um, but I'm betting that there's some things that are having the Scrooge effect in your life. And I know that God would love to see um, that ember of Christmas in your life um, blossoming and growing and as you step into this next year. And so um, here's, my, here's my suggestions, here's my thoughts on how we might be able to not let Herod and Scrooge snuff out um, what God wants to do. And, and the first thing is that, that we ask for help. Um, in the passage that we just read, God showed up to Joseph and said, hey Joseph, grab this baby you need to move somewhere else. And um, I really, truly believe that uh, if we're open to what God wants to do, if we're willing, um, and if we ask for God's help with whatever it is that's going on in our life, He can provide us a path that leads us to, to being back on track with Him and, and experiencing more of what He has for us. Um, and He provided for them. The, the Magi had come from the East. They brought these gifts. And um, those gifts were the most portable source of income you could imagine. Spices, gold, incense, those were all things that Mary and Joseph could take with them straight into Egypt and be set up for however many years they needed to be set up. And here we have this poor family. He's got some carpentry skills, but they need to relocate in an instant. And God provided for them. And um, I truly believe that if we will, um, ask for God's help. He will provide for us. The other thing is, um, I'd invite you to choose uh, to connect as kind of a first step. Um, choose some time during this next week when you can connect with God, when you can connect with some other people, um, and where you can kind of let them be a part of Christmas for you. Um, I think in these times when I have felt the most unchristmassy, unjoyful, unopen, um, it's tempting for me to stay in a cave and to settle into this spot and go, oh, I can't bring myself to do it. Um, and yet, it's being around other people who know the Lord um, that lifts me out of it. And so, um, those are my two, two bits of action. Ask for God's help and, and choose to connect. Um, the next person that I want to take a look at is more of the neutral figure. And, and i got to say, um, this is... Um, was brought to my attention by Earl Palmer. He wrote a, he uh, preached a great sermon called um, No Room at the End. Um, and I had never considered it, and it's a bit, um, and I want to look at the innkeeper in the story. And so let me uh, read for you Luke 2, and um, we'll revisit the night that Jesus was actually born. All right. So Luke 2, 1 through 7. In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that a census should be taken of the entire Roman world. And that was the first census that took place while Quirinius was governor of Syria. And everyone had to go to their own town to register. So Joseph also went up from the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea, to Bethlehem, the town of David, where he belonged to the house and the line of David. And he went there to register with Mary, who was pledged to be married to him, and was expecting a child. And while they were there, the time came for the baby to be born. And she gave birth to her firstborn, a son, and she wrapped him in cloths, placed him in a manger, because there was no room for them in the inn. 
So here we have this young couple. Everybody's on the move. It's like I-5 on Christmas Eve. Everybody driving to try and get back to their home front. And this young couple with hardly any resources shows up in this little tiny town that is packed to the gills with people. And they show up and they look for the innkeeper who would normally house the guests that were coming in. And not surprisingly, there was no room at the inn. And they had very little resources as it was. And so the innkeeper, in seeing this, goes, wow, she is really pregnant, like going into labor pregnant. I can't turn him away, but I can't give him a room. So somewhere in the back corner of the lot, we have this little barn, and you can go over there. And, um, and I think there's a, there's a tendency in the midst of all the chaos, all the busyness, all the presents that still need to be bought, and all the, all the journey that we do, that we go, man, Christmas is an amazing thing, but I just don't have time for that. And so, I do have a little corner in my life that God can go be born in. And, um, and we give him that. I have... Uh, uh, one of my ways of getting into the Christmas spirit is to set up a nativity set. And Christina and I buy a new little figurine for it every year. And she has been cursed by marrying a Bible nerd. And so um, I set this thing up and I try to make it as accurate as possible. So I need to find a counter that has room on it that heads eastward because the wise men have to come <laughs> from the east. <laughs> And they're not quite there yet at the same time as the shepherds are because I think it took them a long time to get there. And I've got these prophets and they have to be like way far away on the timeline because they're like 600 years before. So they have to be on a very long counter, very far away. And, um, and then I have this one figurine that is, um, it is of the innkeeper's wife and we're progressives. Uh, in our house, so we like to think that, well, we don't have the innkeeper, so maybe she was running the joint, so that's cool. Um, but I want to put a picture of it up here uh, for you. The innkeeper's wife is, is the weirdest figurine because she's got her lantern, right, and she's facing this direction, but back behind her is where everything's going on, and she's kind of looking over her shoulder. She can't figure out where she's going. And every time I place this little figurine, and she looks really tired. Um, I feel that. I feel that. Um, every time I place her, I can't get her to look at the right thing. Like, all the animals will even look at Jesus. Some of the shepherds are, like, staring up at the sky, and there's angels there, and they're really excited about it. She, she's just, like, all over the board. And... Um, when we're busy and when we're crazy distracted, I think that's how we feel. Our body's going one way, our attention's going another. Um, we would like to be a part of what's going on over here, but we've got to get over there. And we're not actually there at all. Um, this week, the church website went down, so as you invite people to Christmas, which I hope that you do, remind them that they shouldn't check out the website until we get it back up. But um, the website went down, and, and I... I saw that this had happened, somebody shot me a message on it, and um, and I was sitting there at my mom's house, and, and I, I go, I, I gotta go handle this somehow, and I bustle out of my mom's house, and um, and Christina kind of called me on it later, and was like, mom was really surprised that you just kind of bailed on her, your conversation with her in a heartbeat, and, and even when you are there, half the time you're like on your phone scanning through things, which is a horrible habit of mine, and um, realizing, man, not really present where I'm at. And it's hard. That's hard to face. Um, and especially in this season, I think it's really, really easy to get so distracted that we can't actually embrace being with God and being with other people. And by the time the event's over, we wonder if we even showed up. Um, and so my challenge from our innkeeper in our story is, is this. Um, as you go celebrate Christmas um, with the church like you are now and with your friends and with your family and whatever it is you're doing, um, be there. Be present. Um, give your attention to it. Suck, 
suck the marrow out of, out of that experience, enjoy it to its fullest. And um, as we sing songs like we just did, my, my first thought was, man, that was some good music. But if you sit in the lyrics, man, those carols are rich, mm -hmm. powerful. And so, um, so be present. All right. Um, now to move on to the joy of Christmas. The, the, the folks who got it, I love the folks who got it. They always seem um, to find joy. And that's what I hope uh, for you. And that's what I think God wants to give us. And so we're going to go back to Matthew 2. And we're going to look at uh, the Magi real quick. So um, here's the Magi's experience of Christmas. Matthew 2. After Jesus was born in Bethlehem in Judea during the, king, during the time of King Herod, Magi from the east came to Jerusalem and asked, Where is this one who has been born king of the Jews? We saw his star in the east. We've come to worship him. And when King Herod heard this, he was disturbed all Jerusalem with him. And when he had called together all the priests and the chief priests and the teachers of the law, he asked them where the Christ was to be born. In Bethlehem of Judea, they replied, for this is what the prophet has written, but you, Bethlehem, in the land of Judah, are by no means least among the rulers of Judah. For out of you will come a ruler who will be the shepherd of my people Israel. And then Herod called the Magi secretly, found out from them the exact time that the star had appeared, and he sent them to Bethlehem and said, Go and make a careful search for the child. As soon as you find him, report to me so that I too may go and worship him. And after they heard the king, they went on their way, and the star they had seen in the east went ahead of them until it stopped over the place the child was. And when they saw the star, they were overjoyed. On coming to the house, they saw this child with his mother Mary, and they bowed down and they worshipped him. They opened their treasures. They presented him with gifts of gold and incense and myrrh. And having been warned in a dream not to go back to Herod, they returned to their own country by another route. So, the Magi are uh, they're like astrologers. They're, they're in their own country. They know something of the stars. They're watching the stars. And suddenly, they see the tiniest little change in the sky. A new light. And they know to interpret this as a new king has been born. God is doing something over in Israel. And they go. They gather up some treasures, they go, and they want to honor and worship this newborn king. Um, and the thing that I don't always pay attention to that I caught again this year is um, Herod's reaction was anybody under two years in accordance with the time that the Magi had seen the star. They traveled a long, long ways. They may have shown up in Bethlehem not at my nativity set, so maybe I need to take them out of the set. Um, <laughs> but they showed up maybe a year, a year and a half into Jesus' life, perhaps. They had traveled for a very long time based on seeing a little tiny star. They brought their treasures. They did this arduous journey. They persevered, and they were overjoyed to finally find him. Um, there is a perseverance and a diligence at seeing little things that God has done. Little ordinary moments of Christmas that appear in our lives. That if we will engage them and if we will pursue them, God can unfold beautiful, incredible things for us. Um, this year I got to experience a little a bit of that. My sister came into town and... Um, she said, you know, every year we, we, we buy each other presents, and I don't, I don't think we need to do that this year. Um, she, my sister, by the way, is one of these people who does all of her Christmas shopping before Thanksgiving and looks all through the year for very, very particular personal presents. And I was shocked to hear that she didn't want to do presents, presents either. But her thought was, why don't we find um, some families in need and help them instead? And I was like, oh yeah, we should do that. I can get on that. I'll, I'll try to figure out something. And then she got up into town and I hadn't figured it out yet. And so she goes, well, I think I'm going to go over to Mary's place, uh, which is near our house, and, um, and find out what they need. And so she showed up on the door of this place that has a food bank and cares for some families that are in need. And, and goes, what do you guys need? And they go, well, 
you could uh, get us these kind of items, and then what we're doing is we're building stockings for each person and, and uh, presents for some of the parents. And, um, and so they went to the dollar store, bought a bunch of stuff, and a bunch of stockings, and we all went over to the house, and we had the best time packing stockings full of toothbrushes and toothpaste and any other item that they have let us know that they need and then deliver them. And that was um, Christmas with my family this year. But my sister had taken this little tiny nudge from God, I believe, to go do something for some folks and ran with it. Um, and didn't let the little hindrances that popped up along the way kill it. And, um, and as a result, we found joy in a whole new way in our family. It's really, really beautiful. Um, and so, will we be people this year and this Christmas who grab the little moments from God and give ourselves to them and pursue them and persevere after them? That's what I want to do. Um, the last one is the shepherds. Um, the shepherds strike me in a different way. We're going to go look at them two again. The shepherds might be the most practical of all of them. Um, Luke 2, starting in verse 8. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. And an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Don't be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is the Christ, the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly a great company of heavenly hosts appeared, with the angels praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to each other, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has just happened, that the Lord has told us about. And so they hurried off. They found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. And when they saw him, they spread the word concerning what had been told to them about this child. And everyone who heard it was amazed at what the shepherds said to them. And Mary treasured these things and pondered them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for the things that they had heard and seen, which were just as they had been told. So these shepherds are at their job. They are chilling in a field with a bunch of sheep, making sure the sheep don't get eaten at night. And then some angels appeared and said, this huge thing is going on. You've got to go check it out. And they did. They have virtually no resources. They're the most poor, insignificant people in the culture. And they probably brought their sheep with them. At least that's my theory. Either that or they just ignored their jobs and left the sheep and ran off. But I think they took their sheep with them and they found this lady sitting in a barn with her newborn baby and said, Wow, it's just like what the angels said. They could have dismissed it. They could have said, Wow. I wish that baby had been born during my off schedule because I got sheep to watch. And maybe some poor shepherd had to watch the I don't know. But they, um, they went and checked it out. They, they were busy. They were in the middle of something. And they were interruptible and open to go, man, let's go see if what the angel said is true. Let's go look around Bethlehem. We'll go look in the farmhouses and see if there's any babies being born. What a crazy night. Why not? Um, there's this spirit of exploration that when it gets lost in the midst of our faith, we stop growing and we stop enjoying what God is doing. I've been walking with the Lord a while. I went to school for a long time. And there's a tendency that I can feel at the back of me that wants to go, you know enough, just settle in. Just go to church and we'll do our thing. And I can uh, keep re-looking at the scriptures and, and, and preaching sermons and things like that. But there's this other part of me that's going, you stop exploring, you stop growing, and God has more stuff for you. God has more stuff for this community. God has things that he wants to do in your life. New 
births new joys, new discoveries that he wants to bring. And so they did it. They explored. And what they found was that God broke through in a powerful way. And then they went and told a bunch of other people, guess what? God broke through in a terrible way. In a, in a very amazing way. Now, imagine that conversation. I'm a shepherd. I, I, I usually am working out in those hills over there. But then these angels appeared to me, and they were singing, and they said, i got to go find this baby. And then I went to look for the in this manger, and sure enough, there was a baby there. And so God has shown up, and he saved us. And the people they told were like, Wow, that's really, really crazy. <laughs> and yet, it's crazy enough that I doubt they made it up. So, what am I going to do with this? I love it that earlier when we heard about Herod, all of Jerusalem uh, was disturbed with him. Change in the power structures might be a foot. Um, in Bethlehem, everybody was amazed. God's done something here in this little town? And there is a tendency for the shepherds to go, man, who am I to say this? I'm, I'm, I'm just a shepherd. I'm, I'm, I'm a low life among the community. Um, and I think there's a tendency sometimes that as we look at Harbor and, and the future of Harbor to go, yeah, but we're just, just a little church. Yeah, but we're a little church where God has broken through and is doing something. And God shows up. And when God shows up, neat, crazy, beautiful things begin to happen. So will we be people with our little resources, our not very significant? I like it how Larry describes our church sometimes. We're a church of dysfunctional people. I don't know, I don't know exactly how he says it. But we're, we're a small church of very dysfunctional people, but uh, but we're also <laughs> we're also a place where God shows up. God can do really, really cool things. And so, as we go into this next year, will we be people who make enough space for God, who pursue God, and who use what little we have to bless God and then watch what God does? I'm excited for 2017 to begin about it that way. And I'm excited to celebrate with you all how God broke into our world saved us and loved us and how we get to be a part of showing that love to some other people. Will you do that with me? All right, let's pray. God, thank you for what you've done. And you showed up. You loved us enough to come and be with us. Um, and you've saved us. And this week we get to celebrate you coming to be with us. And so God, do that. Be with us. Um, we open up our lives. We turn our lives over to you. And, and we let you move. May our lives react the same way. May we be people who make space for you and pursue you like the Magi and who um, tell others about what it is that you're doing and um, get to see what you've done and are amazed and overjoyed by it. Lord, don't let us miss Christ.